In the early morning hours of June 18, the ground shook on both sides of Cristo. It was the British 49th Infantry Division being rushed into the positions we had abandoned on the left flank of the 26th SE Grenadier Motorized Regiment. I stood next to the commander of the 3rd Battalion, 26 SS Grenadier Motorized Regiment, and watched as heavy shells worked the terrain that had been abandoned the day before. We congratulated ourselves on the withdrawal made in advance. With the forces of the 49th Infantry Division, Cristo was taken fairly quickly. Soon the attack on Fontenay continued. The ground shook. An avalanche of metal fell on the 10th Company of the 26 SS Grenadier Motorized Regiment fighting in front of us. In a very short time, over 3,000 artillery shells exploded in its positions. The company fought desperately on the northern edge of Parc de Boillon. Tall trees were uprooted and fell on the defensive positions. Following the rampart of fire moved an armada of tanks. The tanks were firing fluently, sending shells into the forest thicket. The enemy infantry advanced, following the tanks, and the company positions were overrun. Some company strongholds continued the fight, but they too were soon suppressed. Our artillery was not in the firing positions that would have stopped the attack. Parts of the 49th British Infantry Division broke through to the southern edge of the woods, but were stopped there by the 9th Company, 26th Cis Grenadia Motorized Regiment. Using short fire support from our artillery, the 9th Company, 26th Cis Grenadia Motorized Regiment, led by the battalion commander, attacked the British. The company marched to the northern edge of the woods, breaking through old positions. In hand-to-hand -hand combat, it pushed the British back to the north. This section of the forest was again held firmly by the 3rd Battalion, 26 SS Grenadier Motorized Regiment, but the victory was short-lived. The concentrated fire of heavy artillery and the aimed fire of tanks inflicted heavy damage on the company. The remnants of the company were pushed back to the northern edge of Fontenay. The division front was stable, but losses had reached a critical level. A divisional reserve was out of the question. Based on radio intercepts, we concluded that on the left flank of our division is brewing a new attack of large enemy forces, and the defence site Brave Tank Training Division was lost Taiyi Sercel. The division fought for TI not one day. On the morning of June 21, I left the division command post and moved to the section of the 26th SS Grenadier Motorized Regiment. At the command post of the 3rd Battalion, 26th Regiment, on a farm north of Fontenay, I met its commander, SS Standart and Führer Monke. The ruins of the farm were surrounded by a high fence. Behind an earthen rampart lay the wounded awaiting evacuation. The dead comrades were buried in the garden. A thick fog, which drifted over the ground, enveloped the ruined buildings. Tanks and anti-tank guns took up firing positions behind the fence and the calculators were busy camouflaging their guns. The enemy was firing harassing fire all along the regiment's section, but especially along the raw Fontenay Road. After a brief debriefing, accompanied by Dr. Steef, I cautiously approached Fontenay. The outskirts of the village were strewn with debris and the noxious smoke of the fires mingled with the fog. Suddenly, two soldiers from the 2nd Battalion of the 26th SS Grenadia Motorized Regiment appeared in front of us. They were holding bowler hats and looking for their squad. We crossed the main street of the village and made our way in a northerly direction. In front of us was the small forest for which such a fierce battle had been fought. Stepping over the bodies of dead Englishmen, I reached the positions of the 15th Company of the 26th SS Grenadier Motorized Regiment. Soldiers with exhausted faces were taking up defences in trenches and craters. There were no officers at all. All of them were either killed or wounded. At night, the scouts took the body of the dead company commander to the rear. What a wonderful relationship must have existed between the company commander and his soldiers, if even his remains were not allowed to fall into enemy hands. The mood of the young soldiers was incomprehensible to us. They briefly informed me of the last battle and their participation in the fighting. Their heroism in battle was obvious to them. They spoke of the enemy without hatred, on the contrary, all the time emphasizing the high morale of the enemy. In the assessments of our soldiers, 
There was also a sense of bitterness when they talked about the advantages of the enemy's combat equipment. And and again I hers. Damn it, where would we be now if we had the same combat equipment as the enemy? We still hadn't seen a single German airplane in the sky. The young soldiers told me that it was time for me to go. As it was beginning to get light and the enemy artillery fire would grow stronger by the minute. A shaft of fire caught us in the centre of the village. I jumped behind a stone staircase and waited for this morning's greeting to be over. One of my companions was lying in the street. A direct hit had torn him to pieces. We fled swiftly through the village, pursued by the hurricane artillery fire that had fallen on Fontenay and were glad to be out of these ruins. A section of the 3rd Battalion, 26th SS Grenadier Motorized Regiment, was also subjected to heavy artillery fire. Was this an overture before the expected offensive? The battalion command post was only 100 meters away, but that distance seemed endless. Finally, by running from cover to cover, we reached it. Meanwhile, the day came and the first reports came in. Fontenay was attacked by the enemy from the direction of St. Pierre and Cristo. Enemy tanks were moving along the low eastern bank of the river and began to make their way toward Fontenay. A tank battle ensued. Our spotted panthers with their far superior guns of the enemy tanks had the advantage. The whole battlefield was strewn with burning enemy tanks. If only we still had plenty of ammunition, our artillery had to fire sparingly. Supply became almost impossible. Telephone communication with division headquarters was not broken, so the operations officer was able to inform me that all was quiet on the right flank of the division. I remained with the battalion until nearly evening and witnessed with my own eyes the astonishingly high morale of the unit. All attacks on Fontenay were repulsed in fierce fighting. The 49th British Division was unable to shake our defences on the left flank. I returned to division headquarters as darkness fell. The blazing front presented a ghostly picture. On the Cayenne Willer Bockage Road the wreckage of several vehicles was still burning. These vehicles were to deliver ammunition to the front. Enemy fighters had relieved them of that responsibility. The ammunition had exploded a few kilometers from the front. I saw the worried faces of my officers. Without talking about it openly, we knew disaster was looming. The static kind of fighting on the murderous bridgehead northwest of the Orne River was inevitably leading to the destruction of the Panzer Division deployed there. Faced with the vast superiority of the enemy, supported by fire at sea, on land and in the air, we could predict where the front would collapse. Tactical entrenchment cost us bloody battles and irreplaceable losses of our best soldiers and destruction of valuable combat equipment. So far we had received no replenishment to replace our wounded or killed soldiers and not a single new tank or artillery piece. After several hours of sleep we were brought back to reality by the noise of the front. Alarms were being sounded at division headquarters. The 49th British Division, supported by heavy artillery fire, was attacking the right flank of the tank training division, to the forest west of the Tessel. Brettville line was already lost, and the onslaught of the 49th British Division was still unstoppable. With a misgiving I went to the 3rd Battalion, 26th Grenadier Motorized Regiment at Fontenay. Danger loomed over the left flank of the division. The whole section of the battalion was under fierce fire. Fontenay was unrecognizable, Howling shells were blowing to pieces the last remaining houses. Every British attack on the village had so far been repulsed. Communication with the companies was cut off. Did smoke from bursting shells hid everything from view. It was impossible to determine where the main line of defence was. The enemy's artillery was laying ramparts of fire one after another. The settlement resembled a bubbling cauldron. Heavy shells burrowed deep into the ground, and when they exploded, left behind huge smoking craters. Taking as a basis an old soldier's saying, a shell does not fall into the same funnel twice. Mm. I jumped into the funnel and watched from there as the enemy tanks attacked Fontenay. Relentlessly firing, feeling safe, the steel monsters slowly moved toward the ruins of Fontenay. Our anti-tank guns were destroyed by the fierce artillery fire of the enemy. Our soldiers clutched their first patrons tightly eye. Man against tank. What a contrast. 
and what heroic spirit was manifested in this contrast. At that moment the first tank went up in smoke. I saw soldiers jumping into the vehicles. The enemy artillery shells were flying over our heads. The commander of the 1st Battalion of the 12th SS Tank Regiment jumped into my funnel and reported about the counterattack of our tank company. Its tanks were about 100 meters behind us and moving forward. The shells of the tank guns whistled over our heads. The enemy tanks in front were fighting against the Grenadier soldiers in the ruins, and the tanks following them had not yet noticed our tanks. The counter-attacking company had to cross the Fontenay Shore Road to get into better firing positions. The tank battle had begun. There were casualties on both sides. Thick, black smoke from burning tanks covered the battlefield. I wanted to see the soldiers in Fontenay, so I ran after the company commander's tank. The battle-weary soldiers waved at me. They shouted joking remarks, their eyes shining. It was a mystery to me where these young, seventeen, to eighteen-year-old soldiers drew their strength from to survive this storm of fire and metal. They assured me over and over again that they would defend the ruins to the last bullet and hold their ground against anyone. The company commander's tank was hit. He turned a few meters to the left. The hatch opened, smoke poured out of the turret, and the company commander climbed out of the hatch with difficulty. He staggered and stumbled toward us, then collapsed to the ground. The soldiers dragged him behind a half-destroyed wall. Only then did we realize that Essos Obersturm for a Ructor Shill had lost his arm. The bloody stump was bandaged, and an orderly was called. So, and this attack of the enemy was repulsed. The 3rd Battalion of the 26th SS Grenadia Motorized Regiment held firmly to its positions and prepared for a new British assault. Fighting was also breaking out in the area to our left. The enemy's advance party was already in Duvigny in the afternoon, and had consequently deepened into our positions on the division's flank. As soon as I arrived in Raw together with the commander of the 26th Grenadier Motorized Regiment, S. Standarten Freera Monkey, the chief of staff, informed me of the situation in the section of the tanked training division and pointed out the danger of a British breakthrough. From the corps' headquarters came the order to enter the battle at about 14.01 of the tank battalions of the division to eliminate the breakthrough on the right flank of the training tank division. The Panther Battalion and part of the Reconnaissance Battalion immediately launched a counterattack. The offensive was conducted after a short artillery preparation through Tessel and Brettville in the direction of a section of forest one and a half kilometers to the west. By nightfall, we knocked the enemy out of the forest, but did not reach their former main line of defense. The enemy lost several tanks. The valiant 3rd Battalion of the 26th Grenadier Motorized Regiment suffered heavy losses during the day's fighting and was withdrawn to positions north of Raw. That same evening orders were received from the Corps to deploy our last tank battalion, the next morning to restore the situation in this area. The tank training division was to be supported at all costs. In vain I asked to cancel this order. Report of the Chief of Staff with a topographical plan of the situation did not affect the decision of the Corps commander and he did not cancel the order. My remark that the enemy tank attack is expected at any moment and the 2nd Battalion of the 12th SS Tank Regiment took a very favourable defensive position was also ignored. And it turned out that on June 26, there was not a single tank left in the sector of our division. The soldiers of the 26th Grenadier Motorized Regiment, exhausted by the last intense defensive battles, languished in anticipation all night in their trenches. They waited for the next attack. A thick, damp fog lay over the barriers and fields. The morning dawned. It's still calm. Max Wunsch and I were in the Raha watching the last tank withdraw to its ramp position. It was getting brighter and brighter. There was not long to wait for the moment when the dance of death would continue. Then the German batteries opened their barrage. British planes at low altitude roared over us and fired their rockets at Rutger. The Devil's War of Extermination had begun. The first of our tanks rumbled forward, clanking their tracks. The attack was at first allowed to occupy the terrain but was stopped by a British counterattack. A fierce tank duel began. 
shadows of impenetrable anti-tank barriers prevented our tanks from taking advantage of the range advantage of their guns. The lack of infantry proved to be a particularly great disadvantage. The intense enemy artillery fire made interaction extremely difficult, making effective command and control virtually impossible. Western from the area east of Raw No Sound reached us. The entire battle had moved to the west, where the tanks were stubbornly battling each other. Eloquent columns of smoke from burning fuel and oil hung in the sky again. Each column pointed to another tank grave. But I was particularly uncomfortable with the situation in the section of the 26th SS Grenadier Motorized Regiment. Not a single artillery strike was coming from the right of Raw. Thank goodness it had started to rain. That meant we were protected from air raids. But what happened next? The ground seemed to split open and swallow us all up. All hell broke loose. All that was left of Raw was the wreckage of shattered trees and houses. I lay in a ditch at the edge of the road, listening to the noise of battle. The barrage of enemy artillery fire continued unabated. Everything was covered with fog, mixed with the smoke of bursting shells. I could not distinguish anything. All telephone lines were cut, and communication with the division headquarters and the units at the front no longer existed. A messenger from the 2nd Battalion, 26th Grenadier Motorized Regiment, ran up to me and shouted, Tanks on the right flank of the battalion. His words were drowned out by the rumble of shell explosions. I listened unsuccessfully to make out the noise of battle, but all I heard was a continuous whistle, crackle, and cannonade of shell explosions, to which was added the clanking of the tracks of the tanks. It was the offensive I had expected. The cornerstone of the German front in Normandy had faltered. Cayenne, as the target of the attack, would be smothered by coverage. Cayenne was to be the prize for Montgomery, who had organized the collapse of the German front. We all watched the deadly spectacle as if mesmerized. The hot metal of large caliber shells whizzed noisily over us and slammed into the ground. I called out to one Shee. The messengers ran across the road and disappeared behind a green hedge. One Shee was by my side for some time longer. I did not need to go into long explanations in front of this experienced soldier. We had been side by side too often. He knew me and knew what I wanted. I outlined my assessment of the situation in a nutshell to one Shee. The enemy is trying to break through on the site of the 26 SS Grenadier Motorized Regiment Large Tank Mass in order to seize Khan. The attack on Juvigny must be immediately cancelled. Raw must be held at all costs, as it too is the cornerstone of the defense. One she is in charge of Raw. I moved again in the direction of Fontenay, and after a few hundred meters came across units of the 3rd Battalion, 26th Grenadier Motorized Regiment. The road was being shot at from enemy tanks. It was impossible to move further north, but there was no need for me to go further forward. The battlefield spread out in front of me like on the palm of my hand. Everything was clear to me, and I found confirmation of my assessments. It was the expected offensive. Tanks and half-tracked enemy armoured personnel carriers were advancing on the 26th Grenadier Motorized Regiment. A shaft of enemy artillery fire was levelling our positions like a giant steel roller, crushing everything alive. Only occasionally I observed the movement of brave soldiers' grenadiers. They stubbornly held their positions, fighting with desperate bravery. I could see the blinding flashes of explosions in Raw. That was the firing of the advancing tanks. North of Raw, British tanks were on fire. Right in front of us on the ground were two Tommy soldiers who had run too far in their attack. They were disarmed and told to get into my car as soon as possible. The wounded Tommy was transferred to the dressing station at Rora. I raced like mad in the direction of Verson. My position was at the divisional command post. The concentrated fire of enemy artillery was being carried southward with increasing intensity. The Colleville area was already under fire. Our artillery fiercely hit the attackers. I reached division headquarters in a few minutes. The chief of staff was still holding the telephone receiver in his hand and reporter. This was our last conversation with the commander of the Sapper Battalion. The end of the Sapper Battalion reported. The enemy artillery destroyed my anti-tank defences. 
British tanks are rushing into the battalion's positions. Individual positions are still held in and around shore. The enemy tanks are trying to crush my dugout. Where are our tanks? I need a counterattack from the row side. At this point, communications broke down. Radio communication was also broken. There was also an urgent report from the 1st Battalion, 26th SS Grenadier Motorized Regiment. The battalion was under attack by a large force. All attacks on saint Marvier had by then been repulsed. New reports came one after another. The whole front line was agitated. Nothing could be done at this point except to concentrate the fire of our artillery on the enemy units that had broken through. The only combat-ready units in the division were the Divisional Escort Company and the Thinning Reconnaissance Company of the 25th Grenadier Motorized Regiment. All forces and means I concentrated on the defense of Verson. From intercepted radio conversations and testimony of prisoners, we learned that on a front of five kilometers attacked a tank division and two infantry divisions of the enemy, each of which was reinforced by a tank brigade. These compounds had not yet been put into battle before. They were absolutely fresh. These three fresh divisions with about 600 tanks attacked three of our battalions with limited combat capability. The main strength of the enemy lay in his colossal artillery reserves and masses of armoured vehicles. The danger of a breakthrough was obvious. My chief of staff was in despair, pointing out the hopelessness of the situation. From the corps was given only one answer. Positions must be defended to the last cartridge. We need to buy time. The IISS Panzer Corps is on its way to the front. As was often the case in the past, command and control was based on a tactical perspective rather than strategic considerations. Important decisions were not made. Mobile defence was forgotten. We were left with no choice but to sell our lives dear. The sky seemed to have adapted to what was happening on the ground. Heavy rain accompanied our every step. To the northeast of Versen, I saw many British tanks passing the positions of the Divisional Escort Company. They were advancing in the direction of Grenville. The front had been broken through, and only isolated pockets of resistance prevented the enemy's advance. My God! The division had to stop the attack. Now it had to prevent a deep breakthrough of British tanks and buy time for the German High Command. I rushed to the Divisional Command post again and tried to get through to Wanshe. It worked. Our brave signalmen had just re-established the line. How often these guys had been through hell. What nameless heroism is hidden behind the expression dogged work of a signalman. Max Wanshi reported large enemy tank units on both sides of the Roar. Every attack on Roar so far had been repulsed with heavy losses to the enemy. The core of the division remained unbroken. A few minutes later I returned to the escort company. All command and control had become impossible. At this point I could only be a soldier among soldiers. The grenadiers' eyes lit up when they saw me walking from squad to squad. These soldiers could not be broken. They were steadfast and would not yield to the enemy. Soon there was not a scrap of ground left where an enemy artillery shell would not burst. On our positions were already exploding shells of attacking enemy tanks. Our defence area was fortified with only two tanks and an anti-tank gun. We clutched tightly to the few remaining FOSS patrons. Here exploded our TIV tank, and right in front of us burned two Shermans. The masses of enemy armour made me nervous. Wasn't it bordering on madness to try to stop this avalanche of steel with a handful of soldiers and a couple of guns? It was too late to reason. There was only one thing left to do. Fight. Two Shermans approached, following the narrow passageway. Several soldiers with false patrons lay in nervous anticipation behind the blackberry bushes. They seemed to blend into the ground. I held my breath, and the explosions of enemy shells suddenly ceased to inspire fear. As mesmerized, we looked at the soldiers who were preparing to jump. The head tank was moving further and further forward along the sagging road, with the second tank slowly following it. They were passing by this place. The second tank had already equaled our soldiers. The barrels of the tank guns were pointed at Versen, but they would not fire again. 
the soldier jumped out at the second tank like an arrow released from a well-tensioned bow. While still in the jump, he fired his fast patron, which struck the side of the Sherman. The tank rolled a few more meters and stopped, fuming. The front tank also stood up. It had lost its tracks, having been blown up by mines. Two tankers surrendered. We breathed a sigh of relief for a moment. A feeling of elation encompassed at the sight of how these steel hulks were destroyed thanks to the personal courage of one soldier. Within seconds, however, the incident with the two tanks was forgotten. Tina Reconnaissance Company was fighting for its life on my right. I could no longer determine its location. The fierce artillery fire was kicking up the muddy ground high into the air. The anti-tank gun was still in its position. It was sending shell after shell into the tank column of the British 11th Armoured Division. Another barrage of fire turned the gun into a pile of metal. We had no more serviceable anti-tank guns. Tank shells crushed the company. The first line of trenches was taken. Here and there soldiers unsuccessfully tried to destroy the tanks with false patrons, but all in vain. Accompanying the tanks, British infantry stopped all attempts to do so. In vain I tried to get artillery support. The spectre of ammunition shortage haunted us for a long time. A couple of shells of German artillery was not enough to stop the frantic attack. The attack of the British tanks continued. I felt for the first time a burning emptiness in my heart and cursed this endless slaughter. What was happening at this moment had nothing to do with war. It was outright murder. I knew each of these young soldiers. The oldest was barely eighteen. Boys who had not yet learned to live, but my God, they already knew how to die. The clanking tracks of British tanks cut short their young lives. Tears streamed down my face. I began to hate the war. The rain pounded relentlessly. Heavy clouds ran over the tortured earth. Meanwhile, the British tanks were rolling toward our positions. It was useless to run. We had to stay. We clutched our fast patrons in our hands. We did not want to die without resistance. Suddenly a new sound joined the devilish concert. A lone tiger was giving us some respite. Its 88 mim shells gave the Shermans an eloquent command to halt. The British had turned back. They cancelled the attack in the direction of Moana. On our return to the division command post, we found two British tanks. Our liaisons had destroyed them with their false patrons. The burned tanks were less than 200 metres from the command post. The personnel entrenched themselves, occupying a circular defence. Heavy fighting led to irreplaceable losses. The breakthrough could not be prevented without fresh units. In the course, we were encouraged that the next day expected reinforcements from the IISS Panzer Corps. The corps insisted that the command post be moved farther to the rear. I objected. Hubert Meyer supported me. In such a critical situation, the place of the commander is on the front line. From the 1st Battalion of the 26th Grenadier Motorized Regiment, I was informed that it had been under continuous attack since morning and that there was nothing left of the battalion's fighting strength. Under cover of night, the remnants of the battalion were making their way back to Carpike Airfield. The young Cess unter Sturmführer E. Milder destroyed two enemy tanks with shaped charges during the night. The tanks were standing in the garden of the chateau. When the shaped charge bounced off the second tank, he returned to the tank and held the charge with the detonator in place with his hands. The tank was destroyed and Emile Durr himself was mortally wounded. He was posthumously awarded the Knight's Cross. By his actions, Durr cleared the way for the retreating battalion. The British were still advancing. I heard our tanks firing from the Grenville side. One company of TIV tanks under SS Hyop Sturmfuhrer Siegel was covering the 2nd Battalion, 12th SS Artillery Regiment, which was changing positions. The British broke through to the battery positions. The artillery battalion commander Moller was killed in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Time lost its meaning for us. We worked with an operational map by flickering candlelight and prepared new defensive positions. I waited impatiently for reinforcements. At midnight, a pleasant surprise awaited me. Michael, my faithful Cossack, suddenly appeared in front of me, smiling full mouth. I was giving him a few days' vacation. 
He brought me a letter from my wife who wrote that we were having our fifth child. Michiel was stopped at a checkpoint. He was suspected of being Russian, but who could have stopped my wonderful Michael? In response to my questions to how he got here, he replied that he had run away. As it began to get light, the enemy resumed their infantry and armoured vehicles attack in the direction of Grinville. Siegel's company had repulsed four attacks by 9-0. Several burning enemy tanks filled the terrain. Unfortunately, Siegel's tank was hit, and he received severe burns to his face and hands. The advance of our tanks in the direction of Chaux failed due to a powerful enemy anti-tank barrage. Although the attack was not successful, a group of 20 men from the 12th SS Engineer Battalion under the command of SS Sturm Banafura SS Muller were pulled out by our forward units and saved from shore capture. That was all that was left of the pallion. A few minutes later, Muller was already standing in front of me. His tired, sunken eyes said it all. There wasn't a piece of intact fabric on his uniform. His knees were bloody and scraped. His face was almost unrecognisable under a layer of dust. One arm was on a makeshift bandage. He recounted the drama of his battalion in a few brief words. After a barrage of artillery fire from 600 guns on the division's left wing, the battalion was crushed by tanks of the British 2nd Armoured Division. The battalion fought on until it was annihilated. Only a handful of men survived the deadly battle. Muller personally defended his command post against all infantry attacks, but he was powerless against the massive tank attack. By noon, Muller and several other soldiers were surrounded at the command post. Some tanks shelled his dugout and others tried to crush him, but without success. The military engineers had constructed an excellent bunker that defied any attempts to destroy it. Finally, a captured German sapper was sent to the dugout to persuade his comrades to surrender. The sapper chose to remain there and share the fate of his battle comrades. The attackers continued to advance and pass the command post after attempting to blow it up. The dugout was badly shaken by the explosions and now looked like a mass grave. The survivors of the dugout eventually fought their way to our position around midnight. They were found completely exhausted at Lee Hort du Bosc, where they decided to make a short halt. During the day, Raw was surrendered. The 2nd Battalion of the 12th SS Artillery Regiment had used up its ammunition. In the afternoon, the enemy managed to establish a bridgehead behind the Odon River near Buron. Our radio intelligence intercepted a message. Are you still insisting on a quick operation against Versen? Obviously, the enemy was well informed about the location of the division command post. We heard no reply. From our division headquarters, everyone who could participated in the fighting at Fontenay. When I entered the divisional command post, I was approached by a stranger. He introduced himself as an employee of the Imperial Ministry of Foreign Affairs and asked me to inform me in detail about the situation. The minister cannot understand why there are constant withdrawals of troops. Before I could briefly describe the situation, tank shells shook our ruins. Enemy tanks were again in front of our command post. Our command post was instantly deserted. Everyone crawled into the trenches with their face patrons waiting for further surprises. I never saw the so-called envoy from the Imperial Foreign Office again. What could he have reported to his superiors? The situation was becoming more critical by the hour. The British managed to create another bridgehead at Garrus. The enemy was slowly but surely advancing southward. By this time, we only had time to put into battle the advanced units of the 12th SS Tank Regiment and reconnaissance groups of the reconnaissance battalion of the 12th SSE Tank Division. Two enemy tanks were destroyed at close range by a battery of six-barrel rocket mortars as they attempted to break into the positions of the rocket artillery division attached to us. It was obvious that Montgomery intended to force the Orne River at St. Andre, and then, probably, to advance to the road for Lays. Kn, the city of Kn, for which there were hot battles, thanks to such a manoeuvre itself will fall into his hands like a ripe plum. We hoped to thwart his plan. We had to hold out for a few more days. The ISS Panzer Corps was on its way. It had been withdrawn from the Eastern Front. 
the 12th SS Tank Regiment was ordered to take Hill 112 and prevent a breakthrough to the bridges over the Orne. A shabby tank company was all that was available to accomplish this task. A few tanks and the remnants of the 15th Reconnaissance Company of the 25th CS Motorized Regiment took over the area near Fontenay. The division command post was moved from Versen to Cayenne. The area facing Versen, Heights 112 and Every was taken over by the IISS Panzer Corps from June 28. At this point we had four SS Panzer divisions at our disposal. However, they were only core divisions, none of them had the combat power of a division. The 9th and 10th SS Panzer divisions were ordered to move to Normandy on June 11, while in Poland as a reserve to repel a possible Russian offensive. The 1st SS Panzer Division Liebstand Date Adolf, Hitler reached the front on June 28. This division was also only a shadow of its former might. It had been withdrawn from Russia two weeks earlier and had to rest and resupply in Belgium. The Leibstand Art Division was not fully manned, neither with combat equipment nor with personnel. The commander of the ISS Panzer Corps, Waffen SS General Paul Hauser, with these forces, was to conduct a counterattack on June 29. During the night, the divisions moved to the areas of concentration, and the site of the 12th SE's Panzer Division was quiet. The positions around Carpike were reinforced by the surviving soldiers of the 1st Battalion, 26th SS Grenadier Motorized Regiment. We were awakened by heavy battleship artillery fire on the morning of June 29. Cayenne was again under fire. Fighter planes were snooping around like hornets in the clear sky and darting down on every vehicle. Erps is a zero. When I was stuck on the road to Versen, a fighter jet exposed a self-propelled artillery unit to fire, and exploding ammunition went flying in all directions. The street was too narrow for a detour, and we had to wait for the fighter to burn out. If only we could get out of this backwater. We were like a rat in a trap, trapped by the ancient walls of the town. The ambulance caught fire. We couldn't save the wounded in it. They were burned alive before our eyes. The enemy artillery was shelling the area between Versen and Hill 112. Shortly thereafter, hurricane fire struck Hill 112 as well. Would the British figure out our plans and attack us before we attacked them? It was with a heavy feeling that I watched the tanks of the British 11th Armoured Division climb the slope south of the Oden River and take Hill 112 in a pincer. The top of Hill 112 is no longer distinguishable, though in the blows of heavy artillery, the Normandy earth was surging around metre by metre. There was no doubt now. The British had launched a preventive attack. Our tank divisions in the areas of concentration were subjected to a barrage of artillery fire and aerial bombardment from the enemy. ISS tank corps left the height of 112. Tanks of the British 11th Panzer Division took a key position for further operations against the Orne River bridges. This entire area was clearly visible from Hill 112. No movement could now escape the British. A little time passed and we spotted a fire control centre at the top of the hill. The heavy artillery battalion of the 12th SS Artillery Regiment was shelling the British forward positions on the height. We had a great view too. We were north of Hill 1212, and we could see the entire slope from the Oden River all the way to the top. The area in front of the 12th SS Panzer Division was amazingly quiet. Only the ship's guns were shelling the crossroads as usual. A shell hit the tank that accompanied me. The explosion of a second 380M shell killed a military doctor. As evening approached, it became obvious that the planned attack of the IISS Panzer Corps was failing. It was impossible to gain ground under superior artillery fire, not to mention the absolute superiority of the Allies in the air. The attack was doomed to failure because of the impossibility of meeting the requirements with the means at our disposal. During the night, we prepared for a circular defence to protect Khan. We envisioned a British breakthrough in the western part of the city. In the midst of these preparations, an order was received from the IISS Panzer Corps to renew the attack on Hill 112 and the British 7th Panzer Division. Nothing surprised us anymore. Max Wanshi immediately joined me and was ordered to attack. 
His tanks and the remnants of the 12th SES Motorized Reconnaissance Battalion had to carry out the attack. We began to treat our tanks like crystal. Up to this point we had received no tank resupply and our forces were melting every day. The constant use of incremental tactics pissed me off. Ever been like this in the days of big tank offensives? Centrantrated fire hit Hill 112 at dawn. Our tanks in the morning gloom came close to the height and took cover before the final assault. It will begin in a few minutes. One she and I smoked our last cigarette. A handshake and the dance began. In accordance with common practice, the tanks pressed forward on the once tree-covered hill, firing fragmentation shells. The enemy artillery tried to suppress our assault with heavy fire, but it failed, and the height was again in our hands. Soon we reached the summit and cut off the retreat of a British company on their machine-gun armoured personnel carriers. They were taken prisoner. Burning tanks stood on either side of Hill 1212. On this hill there was not a square metre of ground left untreated by shells and bombs. The mastery of Hill 112 gave the IISS tank corps some respite. Most importantly, the possibility of adjusting and controlling artillery fire from this height was eliminated. Decisive battles around Caen. During the last battles with the troops of the British VI Corps, consisting of the 15th Scottish, 43rd and 49th British Infantry, and 11th Panzer Divisions, the 12th SS Panzer Division suffered heavy losses. The combat strength of the 26th Grenadier Motorized Regiment was reduced to the strength of a weak battalion. The 12th Panzer Regiment also suffered heavy losses. Only a mixed company remained at the disposal of the 12th Motorized Reconnaissance Battalion, and the 12th Motorized Engineer Battalion ceased to exist at all. The division lost one battalion of its artillery regiment as a result of heavy shipboard gunfire and constant assault raids. Our 12th SS Panzer Division could no longer be considered fully operational. At best, what was left of it was comparable to a task force. However, despite the monstrous strain and brutal losses of the last battles, the compound was considered a fully capable panzer division tasked with the defence of KN. The VI British Corps concentrated its forces on the flank of the 12th SS Panzer Division. Montgomery's plan to take our troops in pincers was clearly seen. Even for the layman was clear that the next target of the Allied attack will be Cayenne. To avoid the risk of being cut off from the division, the divisional command post was moved to the centre of the city. I wanted to share the fate of my soldiers. The chief of staff and I had no illusions. We knew that the fulfilment of the Führer's order, Khan must be defended to the last cartridge, meant the end of the division. We wanted to fight. We were ready to give our lives, but the battle had to have a purpose. I became furious at the thought of my young soldiers bleeding and dying in the city ruins. The division must be saved for a more flexible way of fighting. There was only minor activity in the division section, but Canadian tactical reconnaissance was very tangible. Enemy reconnaissance teams were constantly probing Carpike and the western edge of the airfield. The division was under the impression that the Canadians were planning to attack Carpike to break the front north of Cayenne. Carpike was an old Norman peasant village with houses made of hewn stone. The village blended into the surrounding countryside and formed a long passageway bounded by the Cayenne Bayou Railroad on one side and the airfield on the other. The village all along its length was visible from the observation post in the monastery at Arden. I went to see the defenders of Carpike. The streets and houses were deserted. The roads were still passable, only in some places debris cluttered the passage. The empty village looked ominous. I found defenders on the western outskirts. About fifty soldiers from motorised units had taken refuge in several trenches and crevices dug by the former defenders of the airfield. These fifty men were all that remained of the 1st Battalion, 26 SS Grenadier Motorised Regiment. The remnants of this battalion occupied the far edge of the airfield, and the total defence here held from 150 to 200 soldiers. At the disposal of those who defended Carpike, now there were no longer any anti-tank means. Battalion anti-tank guns had been destroyed a few days ago. 
However, there were minefields in front of Karp. The grenadier soldiers knew their task. The platoon commander and his soldiers were to withdraw and engage in diversionary fighting on the eastern outskirts of Carpike and force the attacking Canadians into the village. To the east of Carpike, 88 MIM guns were placed in ambush. In addition, the outskirts of the village were within range of tanks deployed in firing positions. After the previous fighting and losses to replenish the infantry in this area was nothing. The only defence option for us was to concentrate all the remaining heavy weapons. Our artillery and mortars had already taken aim at the village. After returning to the command post, I was informed about the lively radio conversations of the enemy. Their assessment allowed me to conclude that the enemy had concentrated his forces in Norre and Malvia. The radio conversations increased considerably on July 3. Taking advantage of a favourable opportunity to disrupt the enemy's preparations for an attack, or at least to inflict heavy losses on his units, apparently gathered in a limited area. At 6.0, this area was covered by the concentrated fire of artillery. Our strike on the area of concentration proved very effective. While the rocket mines of our six barrel mortars, leaving behind them a long fairy plume, whistled over the airfield, I scrambled through the ruins of the airfield buildings to find Bernhard Krause. Krause had chosen the bomb shelter as his command post. From here he could view the airfield and carpike. In the bunker of the bomb shelter I met the artillerymen's forward observer. At a distance of 75-100 metres in front of us were several Grenadier soldiers. Among the ruins of the destroyed buildings of the airfield took positions five tanks. They were well camouflaged. Enemy attack aircraft in this area were very active. As soon as Bernhard Krause began to report to me on the progress of the fighting for Saint Movia, there was a rumble and shrill shouts all around us. When 380M and 406M battleship shells exploded nearby, the bunker shook violently. The 3rd Canadian Infantry Division moved out to attack. Its objectives were Carpike and the airfield. What a tremendous expenditure of manpower and resources it took for the enemy to destroy a handful of our soldiers. Concentrated artillery fire of the enemy suppressed all efforts of the defenders. Probably several artillery regiments were engaged. From the heavy shells of the ship's guns, whole hangars were blown into the air. The village at this point was unrecognisable. Thick puffs of smoke drifted westward. Above our heads, enemy Hawker Typhoon fighter attack planes were searching for their victims. The explosions of their missiles were barely audible over the bursting shells of heavy guns. The forward observers adjusting the artillery fire seemed unaffected by this and remained at their stereo tubes. They asked for the last cover fire. The 8th Canadian Brigade, reinforced by the Winnipeg Rifles and supported by the Fort Garry Horse Tank Regiment, rushed on the remnants of Krause's battalion. The enemy artillery fire was shifted deep into our defences. My comrades looked at me. Their faces were pale. No one said a word. Only the voices of artillery fire adjusters were heard. Enemy tanks rolled forward from Marseille. The Fokker artillery shells were falling between the advancing tanks, but it seemed that our artillery fire hardly bothered them. The tanks crept slowly in our direction. The grenadiers were in their bomb shelters waiting for orders to take up their firing positions, as everyone was in cover during the hurricane fire. The first enemy infantrymen appeared from the woods. Our artillery covered the edge of the woods with fire, inflicting heavy damage on the Winnipeg rifles. We were still sitting crouched in cover, and only our tanks returned fire. They were almost indistinguishable among the ruins and airfield buildings, the tension that had gripped us was becoming almost unbearable when we heard the noise of battle and waited for the first bursts of machine gun fire from our forward machine gun nests. I spotted enemy flamethrowers joining the offensive fighting on the western edge of the village. Climbing on light tanks, they moved forward under cover of Shermans. One of them hit a minefield and burst into flames. Fifty of our soldiers at Carpike were attacked by three enemy infantry battalions supported by tanks. The battle in the village was fierce. The advance of enemy tanks was hindered by the wreckage of houses. The tank attack through the flying field 
failed as they were our well-camouflaged tanks and a battery of 88 Mien guns. Only a few minutes passed. The Winnipeg riflemen advanced uncertainly, obviously not trusting the deceptive desolation of the battlefield very much. They slowly advanced towards the first airfield building. At this point they were still about 150 metres away from it. The Canadians had emerged from the protection of the woods and were in the open space of Tatel. Then we heard the long-awaited voice. tra ta 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 it was our MG-42 machine gun mowing down the enemy. I jumped to the corner. Soldiers were popping out of the bunker. Not a word was spoken. They all sprinted to take their former positions. The infantry battle was now on the agenda. With sleeves rolled up and eyes fixed on the enemy, the young warriors loaded their weapons and fired automatically. The attackers had obviously suffered heavy losses. The course of their attack was disrupted and their tanks began to seek cover. Krause's battalion was not without casualties either. The wounded were dragged to bunkers and cared for. Not all was going well at the far end of the airfield. The Canadians had advanced here and the battle was already going on in the centre of the village. Our artillery fire was concentrated on the western part of it. I telephoned the chief of staff and prepared him that Carpike had been lost but that I had no concern about the southern part of the airfield. The remnants of the 1st Battalion, 26th SS, Grenadier Motorized Regiment, would be able to hold their ground here. The battalion commander was again, as had often been the case in the past, the linchpin of the defence. Bernhard Kraus was the chief grenadier of his battalion. In a low, calm voice he gave instructions to his soldiers and was like a father figure to them. No unpleasant surprises were expected in this section of the front line. I said my goodbyes and started to make my way onward to the blasted hangars on the eastern edge of the airfield. Erich Holson was waiting for me there. A few minutes later we were back at the division command post and breathed a sigh of relief. It was not very pleasant to drive a Volkswagen under enemy artillery fire. Our radio technical reconnaissance department worked excellently. These guys deserved praise. As a result of their radio intercepts, we were well informed about enemy movements. This was especially true in the battle for Carpike. The commander of the De La Chautardier Regiment was reporting by radio to his brigade headquarters on the capture of a settlement while in the village. He was ordered to return, but artillery and mortar fire restrained his movements. Every time he announced his departure, our new shelling followed. Only about 20 of the grenadiers who had so stubbornly defended Carpike still remained combat ready. All of the non-commissioned officers were killed. The surviving soldiers took over the duties of the guard unit of the 88 Mean Battery deployed immediately east of Carp. Widenhop's SS battalion attempted to counter-attack the enemy at Carpike on the night of July 4-5, but was unsuccessful. The enemy in Carpike suffered considerable losses as a result of several of our hurricane bombardments with shrapnel and incendiary shells. Even during the offensive launched on July 8 at Cayen, the enemy at Carpike remained on the defensive. We held the airfield until July 8. After the enemy failed to expand the bridgehead on the Odon River and break through to the Orne River, his attack from the west to capture the airfield also failed. Therefore, we decided that he would now try to break the cornerstone of the German defence frontal attack, then break deep into the territory of Normandy. We prepared for a decisive battle for Cain. After visiting during the past few days all the units in their positions and talking at length with the rank and file, non-commissioned officers and officers about the continued defence of Cain, I was convinced that the town would become a tomb for our brave division. The defence of the town further was impossible. The ratio of forces was too unequal. The weakened forces of the Germans were unable to hold the defence here to a considerable depth. There were no reserves at hand ready for battle. From the division to the headquarters of the corps was transmitted an alarming, unambiguous message. It said that the exhausted forces of the division were not enough to hold the territory, reflecting the blows of significantly superior enemy forces. However, the corps could not place any additional forces at our disposal. We had made all the necessary preparations to meet the expected enemy attack as effectively as possible. 
but we had no answer to the question of what would happen if an airborne force was dropped to the rear of the division and entered an unprotected part of the city. The division was confident that the offensive on Kien would begin with an airborne operation south of the town, while simultaneously advancing from the Odon bridgehead across the Orne toward the Cain Falaise Road. Breakthrough of the German front line to the full depth could not be prevented, and then the road to Paris will be open. On the evening of July 7, we realized that the next 24 hours would decide the fate of Cayenne. Some 500 British Lancaster and Halifax bombers dropped 2,500 tons of bombs on the northern outskirts of the city late in the afternoon. From the fighting order of the planes, a small number of them were shot down by the fire of our anti-aircraft guns, but no losses were reported on our side either. Combat units from the bombardment hardly suffered any damage. However, the streets of Cayenne were cluttered and again, horrible as it was, civilians were sacrificed. The hospitals were overcrowded. It should be said here that relations of friendship and mutual aid were established between the German troops and the local French population. Hitherto there had been no manifestations of hostility or rancor on the part of the French. They looked at the ruins of their homes in confusion and shook their heads unable to comprehend the fact that their town had been destroyed. They knew that on that day, as on June 6, there was not a single German military unit in the city limits. During all the fighting, our military units did not need to allocate a single soldier to maintain security in the city. The French themselves took care of maintaining discipline and order here. The British air raid seemed to be a prelude to the main assault. Everyone, down to every last soldier, was at the ready. The artillery was waiting for the order to open a barrage covering our positions. The telephones were silent. We stared intensely into the darkness of the night and waited for the appearance of enemy infantry and tanks to open fire. Minutes passed and nothing broke the silence. It was incomprehensible, but it was so. The Allies made no attempt to utilize the results of their devastating bombardment. I met again with the commanders to see for myself the effect produced by the Lancaster and Halifax air raids, and, amazed, found that I had overestimated their effect on the morale of our troops much more. The troops hated fighter assaults more than massive bombing raids by lumbering monsters. Indeed, the front line was so sparsely filled with our troops that area bombing could not do much damage to them. The 2,500 tons of bombs could only topple a few self-propelled artillery pieces. The troops were expecting a big attack and were preparing for the inevitable. We did not harbor false hopes about the outcome of the battle. As dawn broke, I, burdened with misgivings, awaited the onset of a difficult day. Hubert and Meyer had fallen asleep at the table with a map spread out on it. What a marvelous chief of staff this comrade of mine turned out to be. Artillery fire of incredible intensity. Both ground and naval forces rained down on the front line of the 12th Cis Panzer Division. Our underground was shaken in all its corners. Plaster and dust littered the candlelit map. Our artillery and rocket-propelled six-barrel mortars opened barrage fire for the last time. We struggled day after day to get ammunition, trying to give as much help as possible to our hard-fighting infantry. Enemy fighters stormed our artillery positions from the air and attacked every vehicle on the roads. The bridges on the Orne River were also subjected to continuous air attacks. The first reports came in. All our battalions were fighting heavy defensive battles. The enemy attacked along the entire front with strong support from tanks. Our neighbour on the right, the 16th Airfield Division, was not suitable for the task assigned to it. It was battered by renewed bombardment and its will to resist was broken under the weight of the enemy's offensive power. The 3rd British Infantry Division broke through the positions of the 16th Airfield Division and soon began to threaten a deep penetration and envelopment of our division's flank. A section of our division's defences was defended by four half-knocked-out battalions, while the enemy attacked here with units of the 59th British and 3rd Canadian Divisions, reinforced by tank brigades. The main blow seems to have been struck at the site of the 1st Battalion, 25th Grenadier Motorized Regiment, by forces of the 59th Infantry Division. 
Moreover, this battalion was also attacked by units of the 3rd Canadian Infantry Division. Already during the first hour of the battle, the battalion lost almost all of its company commanders. S.E. Sturmbannführer S.S. Waldmuller, the battalion commander, was among the soldiers of his unit and was the heart of its resistance. The 1st Company of the 25th Grenadier Motorized Regiment covered the right flank, and its fire overturned any possibility of a relatively easy advance by the 3rd Canadian Infantry Division into the section of the doomed 16th Airfield Division. The valiant 1st Battalion, 25th Grenadier Motorized Regiment, stood on the battlefield like a breakwater in a raging sea remaining despite the huge superiority of the enemy in manpower and equipment unshakable, it repelled all attacks. The enemy during this first assault could not crush the battalion. The 2nd Battalion of the 25th S. Grenadier Motorized Regiment also put up heroic resistance. Its anti-tank guns had long since been destroyed by enemy artillery fire. Only fast patrons remained at the soldiers' disposal. All company commanders were also killed. Sipe Sturmfuhrer Dr. Tyree destroyed three Sherman tanks by his own hand and was killed trying to send the crew of the fourth one to the other side. The 3rd Battalion, 25th Cisgrenadier Motorized Regiment, came under attack from the 3rd Canadian Infantry Division. It fought among the ruins of Buron and O.T., where the battle took on a particularly heavy and fierce character. The Canadians had not forgotten that their advance at Byron and O.T. had already been halted on July 7, at which time they paid a dear, bloody price. The grenadiers of our battalion held their ground in the ruins, fighting fiercely for every inch of ground. I did not understand why the Canadians did not continue their attack from the Carpeak side. Opposite the enemy captured Carpike, we had only a battery of 88 MIM guns and the remnants of the 1st Battalion, 26th SS Grenadier Motorized Regiment, 6th Battalion had been practically exsanguinated in the previous battles. A vigorous enemy attack from Carpike toward the Orne Bridge at Caen would decide the fate of the 12th SS Panzer Division within hours. The only combat-ready reserve we had was a newly arrived tank company with 15 Panthers. Urgent reports from the front line began to arrive one after another. It looked like the 16th Airfield Division had been wiped out. Our division immediately sent part of the 2nd Battalion, 12th Armoured Regiment and a Divisional Escort Company to cover the area northeast of Cayenne at Cabaret. The 1st Battalion, 12th Armoured Regiment, fought on the northern outskirts of the city. Enemy fighters attacked continuously the bridges over the Orne and the access roads south of Cayenne. All movement in the direction of Cayenne became impossible. We could not evacuate our wounded or get the necessary supplies. The roads became deadly dangerous. Bombers from the north were again roaring across the sky, targeting the city. We could hardly believe that this long-suffering city was to suffer the horrors of bombing again. The amount of enemy manpower and equipment involved in the storming of the city could hardly be imagined. God only knows why this city, not yet occupied by enemy troops, was razed to the ground by massive bombardment. Except for the headquarters of the 12th CS Panzer Division, which had been there only for the last couple of days, there were no military formations in the city. The first wave of bombers attacking the bridges caused fires south of the River Orne. The city centre was carpet-bombed again. Cayenne was covered in fire, smoke and ash. We suddenly saw the last wave of bombers heading towards the garrison church and dropping their bombs. I jumped through the entrance to the basement that served as our command post and crammed myself into the farthest corner. A monstrous rumble shook the dungeon and the candles went out. I gasped for breath. I could hardly see my hand in front of my eyes because of the thick cloud of dust. Hubert Meyer called out to me and the voices of others were heard. We are buried alive. The young soldier was with difficulty calmed down. Into the open cellar door he flew thrown back by the blast wave. The garrison church, just 50 metres from the command post, was completely destroyed. All we saw in its place was a huge crater. Stone blocks had been blown into the air by the explosion, and they fell on the camouflage net under which our mobile radios were located, thus depriving us of all radio communication. 
We soon overcame this problem by restoring the interrupted communication system. Again, there were many civilian casualties. A few minutes after the bombing, General Eberbach, commander of the 5th Panzer Army, arrived at the division command post. General Eberbach was the successor to General Geer von Schweppenberg. Eberbach was able to take advantage of the lull between bomber raids on the bridges over the Orne. The commander appreciated the division's actions. He was not yet aware of the disaster that had befallen the 16th Airfield Division. General Eberbach immediately realized the gravity of the situation and ordered the 21st Panzer Division to the section of the front, which was occupied by the 16th Airfield Division. However, only a reinforced battalion of the 21st Panzer Division was able to cross the Orne that day. At a time when the commander was still with us, received alarming reports. The enemy had broken through at the junction of the 2nd and 3rd Battalions of the 25th CS Grenadier Motorized Regiment, namely between Gaumanch and Bouben. He took Conte and controlled the approaches to the monastery at Ardennes. The 2nd Battalion, 12th Armoured Regiment, except for units fighting east of the railroad on the former 16th Airfield Division ground, was immediately thrown into a counterattack. It displaced the enemy but was unable to repel Conte due to its superiority in the number of tanks. The enemy stopped our counterattack. General of Tank Forces Eberbach said goodbye to us. I was sure that he would do everything to prevent further loss of life in the ruins of Khan. The battle continued with the same intensity. It was a mystery to me why the Canadians and British were advancing so uncertainly. Their overwhelming superiority in tanks was barely utilized. Instead of quickly and deeply wedging their tank formations into our defenses and creating a bridgehead behind the Orne, they used tanks only to support the actions of their infantry. With the exception of extremely mobile and well-controlled artillery, the attackers lacked control and initiative on the battlefield, and the enemy went to Storm Khan, guided by tactical principles used in the First World War. Fighting in this manner could be afforded if you were up against an already exsanguinated enemy. Lieutenant General Sievers, commander of the 16th Airfield Division, appeared at the command post of the 12th Cess Panzer Division and asked to be briefed on the situation. He had been out of contact with his units for several hours. The report was a heavy blow to him. He immediately went to the northeastern outskirts of Cayenne to assess the situation personally on the spot. He tried to reassemble the remnants of his division, scattered by the enemy, and re-establish a stable front. However, the morale of the men of his units had fallen so low as to make it impossible to do so. The all-destroying force continued to advance. Slowly but surely, the battlefield was turning into a moonscape. In the afternoon, the enemy took Grouchy. After a long, bloody battle, the 16th Company of the 25th SS Grenadier Motorized Regiment, defending it was completely destroyed. The brave Sapper Company under the command of Ses Obersturm Führer Werner was exterminated. The only person I later saw from this company was a liaison officer. The Sappers died in their positions. After fighting with mixed success, O.T. and Frankville were lost. During the counterattack, the commander of the 3rd Battalion of the 1st SS Grenadier Motorized Regiment, Übersturmführer Weidenhaupt was wounded. The battalion still managed to stop the enemy attack north of Arden. The division situation was extremely serious. The three battalions of the 25th Grenadier Motorized Regiment were on their own, almost surrounded and engaged in fierce fighting in Melon, Gamanche and Buren. Wire communications were broken. Radio communication remained the only means of communication. The front of the division was stretched to the limit. There were no more reserves. Only 15 Panther Company von Ribbentrop stood on the reverse slope of the heights north of the city. I couldn't take it any more. I wanted to personally see the situation and in the midst of the battle to make the necessary decisions. The Führer's order not to surrender Cayenne was impossible. We could hold out maybe for a couple more hours, but then there would be no one left alive in the division. I resisted sacrificing the division. Hubert Meyer supported my intention to leave the ruined city to the Allies without a fight and take the division to the eastern bank of the Orne. Eric Holson saddled his fast horse. Our good Volkswagen was ready to go. Michael, my faithful Cossack, 
was already sitting in it when I approached. We knew we had a wild race ahead of us. In a few minutes we reached von Ribbentrop's Panther Company. Its advanced tanks were already in action against the Shermans at Conte. In front of us was the monastery at Arden. Its entire complex was subjected to artillery fire, and the tall towers no longer existed. Their ruins gazed reproachfully into the sky. On the reverse slope of altitude, I suddenly felt uneasy and took the wheel. It was impossible to stop or turn in this situation. Craters from bombs and shells covered the entire battlefield. See, as soon as we left behind us, the last rise of shells began to fall and burst around us. Enemy tanks in Conte covered us with their fire. A cold sweat broke out as the car skipped over this stretch of terrain. If only there were not that wild chirping of enemy machine guns. Only a few meters separated us from the ruins. We made it. Direct fire was no longer getting us. The monastery garden looked like a garden in hell. Shells exploded one after another in front of the regimental command post. We hesitated for a few seconds before making a final throw. Taking advantage of the pause in the shelling, we rushed towards the building. Around the headquarters, the bodies of dead soldiers lay everywhere. Jumping out of the car, I recognized one of the dead as the commander of the headquarters company. He was hit by shrapnel, stumbling and catching our breath. We rushed into the old building and found in the basement the commander of the 25th Sess Grenadier Motorized Regiment. He was wounded and was talking to the commander of the 3rd Battalion of his regiment, S. Hauptsturm Führer Steger. The radio was the only means of communication with the battalions. The ceiling above us seemed to move, even though the monastery keller was deep underground and supported by huge arches. We could hear a continuous humming. I spoke to Hauptsturm Führer Steger in the Buren. He reported that most of his battalion had been killed in action, and that enemy tanks were already behind the village. He asked for immediate support. All available tanks were sent to Burian in order to punch a gap in the encirclement ring of the remnants of Steger's battalion. The attack failed. From the church tower I watched the tank battle, which was going on with varying success. Both sides suffered heavy losses. The enemy tanks from Moti rushed in the direction of Arden. Von Ribbentrop's tank company destroyed three tanks while defending the regimental command post. The burning tanks were 100 meters west of Arden. There were more wounded crawled into the large monastery cellar. The older lies were showing marvels of skill in saving the lives of their wounded comrades. Dr. Eric Guttering worked without knowing fatigue to alleviate suffering and pain. The moans of the wounded in the old cellars were simply unbearable. The wounded were coming in in a continuous strip. We could not give up the fight. We had to wait until nightfall to evacuate our wounded comrades under the cover of darkness and give our forward units a chance to break out. I got into the panther and drove towards Cussy. The defense of Cussy was held by the battery commander of the 1st Company, 1st Company 12th SS Anti-Aircraft Artillery Division, Harpsturmfuhrer Ritzel. You see, this small town had become a mere pile of ruins. In front of the battery positions stood three burning Shermans. The battery suffered heavy losses. One gun was put out of action by enemy artillery fire. Shep Sturmfuhrer says himself stood at one of his guns. He promised me that he would do everything to hold the position until nightfall in order to enable the wounded to be evacuated from Arden. Shortly afterward, I returned to the monastery. At this point, the enemy infantry and tanks had stormed into Byron. Because of the smoke and explosions, I could not see Steger's command post. Around the positions of the remnants of the 3rd Battalion of the 25th Sess Grenadier motorized regiment flame-throwing enemy tanks were raging. Enveloped in flames, German soldiers jumped out of their trenches and fell to the ground. Flamethrower tanks were the most terrifying weapons. Small, machine-gun armed armoured personnel carriers operated only under cover of the fire of their big brother's tanks, and therefore they were also very difficult to hit. Enemy tanks captured Steger's command post, and the battalion headquarters ceased to exist. The fighting continued only in the western part of the Buren, Standard 10th Ura Milius. Commander of the 25th SS Grenadier Motorized Regiment, 
was ordered to evacuate the monastery after dressing the wounded and take up positions on the outskirts of Cayenne. I wanted to bring the remnants of the division to the eastern bank of the Orne during the night. The enemy began practicing shooting again, targeting our Volkswagen. Not least through incredible luck we reached the ruins of Cayenne. After returning from Arden, I reported the critical situation to Corps headquarters and without delay requested permission to withdraw the remnants of the division to the east bank of the Orne. I had no doubt that Khan could not be held. At Corp headquarters, the request was denied. The Führer ordered that the town be held at all costs. All protests and my arguments about the pointlessness of further sacrifices did nothing. We were to die in Kana. I was seized with frenzied rage at the thought that the valiant soldiers who had been fighting day and night for four weeks should sacrifice themselves for nothing. I refused to carry out the worthless order and began the evacuation of the city. The heavy guns quickly took up new positions on the east bank of the Orne. After dark, the battalions were withdrawn beyond Cayenne. The way they had to be cleared with a fight by a small group of our remaining tanks. In the 3rd Battalion of the 25th SS Grenadier Motorized Regiment, there were about 100 regular and non-commissioned officers left. All others were killed, wounded or missing in action. A lull had settled on the battlefield. We were glad that the Canadians were inactive. Had they continued the attack during the night, the division would have been completely destroyed. The Canadians entered the monastery and prevented us from continuing the evacuation of the wounded. Shortly after midnight, Sestandert and Fuermilius requested that artillery fire be opened on Arden to gain some respite. Since this measure was the only option to clear the way for our wounded comrades, I authorized batteries of reactive six-barrel mortars to fire two salvos on the monastery. Our observer in Arden was adjusting the fire. The enemy withdrew. In the end, our wounded were evacuated. The monastery was abandoned. It the standout and fewer Emilius reported the evacuation from Arden at midnight. The survivors took up new positions on the outskirts of the town. The 88M batteries in Cussy died at their guns. They fought heroically, making it possible to evacuate their wounded comrades. Essers Haupt Sturm Fioretzel was killed in hand-to-hand -hand combat at the position of his battery. Shortly after midnight I assembled all the commanders and informed them of my decision to evacuate the city during the night and take up new positions east of the River Orne. The commanders dispersed, they unanimously supported the decision to evacuate the division from the destroyed Khan without a fight. At 2 o on the northern outskirts of Cayenne, I searched for the 1st Battalion of the 25th S Grenadier Motorized Regiment. The remnants of the battalion had to fight their way through the enemy position, leaving a bloody trail behind them. The losses of the battalion could be shocking. SOO Obersturmführer Schunemann's platoon was defending among a group of peasant houses. The grenadiers could no longer break through to their own. According to radio intercepts, this unit was still fighting two days later. Then it was destroyed by an attack of enemy fighters from the air. I found the survivors of this battalion in a bomb shelter on the outskirts of the city. The soldiers, completely exhausted from the fighting, were sleeping a deep sleep. The officers took over sentry duties. What luck that the British and Canadians did not pursue them. The soldiers of the 12th SS Panzer Division were at the limit of their physical abilities. They fought on the front line for weeks and felt the crushing blows of all means of modern warfare. They had gone to war a few weeks ago with fresh, blooming faces. Now their camouflaged, mud-covered steel helmets cast a shadow over weary faces with eyes that had too often peered into the other world. These soldiers were the picture of human suffering. But that didn't matter now. They could not be allowed to continue resting. They had to defend the eastern bank of the Orne. Waldmuller received a new order and pulled his soldiers from their heavy sleep. Each individual grenadier was to be awakened immediately. Staggering, the half-asleep soldiers crawled out of the bunker and hung their weapons, heavy machine gun belts around their necks again, swearing. They dragged the two heavy infantry guns, turning toward the burning city that was to be crossed. Two German tanks guarded the northern approaches to the town. 
During my absence, my division chief of staff tried again and again in vain to get permission from Corps headquarters to evacuate from Cayenne. Finally, at about 3-0 in the Corps, gave such permission. Since the withdrawal of our troops had actually already begun, and the heavy weapons had already taken up their new firing positions east of Orne, the evacuation was accomplished quietly and without interference from the enemy. The new positions were taken up in a stretch extending from the KN railroad station to the bend of the Orn at Flores one The men were exhausted and unable to begin to establish new positions. After crossing the Orn and reaching their new positions, the soldiers fell into a deep sleep, relying on their comrades guarding the northern outskirts of the city. In the morning, the 2nd Company of the 12th Dessa's Anti-Aircraft Artillery Division left its position on the western edge of Khan, facing Carpike. Even there, just 100 metres east of Carpike, there was still no contact with the enemy. At 4.40, the division headquarters left KN and established its command post at Carsil. It was expected that our division would be replaced in the position by the 272nd Infantry Division. The new command post was located under a canopy of trees between ancient beech, oak and elm. The neat Norman mansion in a secluded spot in the park had peace and quiet. Unfortunately, we had no opportunity for recreation. At least I had the opportunity to perform a nice ablution with two buckets of water and washed myself from head to toe. By apps again, I had again visited the units in the southern part of Cayenne. Soldiers and officers were lying like corpses in the gardens on the banks of the Orn. They had fallen into a deep slumber and slept like the slain. The troops were at the limit of their physical capabilities. Enemy reconnaissance patrols did not begin to probe the approaches to the city until the afternoon. In the middle of the afternoon, the last units of the 12th and 21st SS Panzer Divisions had already crossed the Orn. After the commander of the 3rd Battalion of the 26th SES Grenadier Motorized Regiment, Old Buter, crossed the Orne, the last bridge was blown up. By evening the first shells were fired by the opposing sides from each of the banks of the Orne. Three Allied divisions occupied the northern part of the Khan. On July 11, the division was replaced by the 272nd Infantry Division. This took place without enemy interference. On the section of the division operated only reconnaissance groups of the enemy. Therefore, completely exhausted compounds had time to equip defensive positions. From the beginning of the invasion to the evacuation from Kana on July 9, the division suffered heavy losses in manpower and equipment. More than 20% of the soldiers were killed in action, and more than 40% were reported wounded or missing. The fighting spirit of the young soldiers cannot be better summarized than by the former enemy. The 12th Cess Panzer Division, which defended this area, fought with a tenacity and assertiveness that was never seen anywhere else during the entire campaign. From the evacuation from Cayenne to the Falaise Sac, after the bloody fighting around Cayenne, the 12th Armored Division was withdrawn south to the Potini area for rest and resupply. The 12th S Artillery Regiment and the 12th C S Anti-Aircraft Artillery Division were attached to support the 272nd Infantry Division, which had replaced us in the positions at Cayenne. Since a long rest in the area close to the front was out of the question, the regimental headquarters were transferred to the Vimorti area. They were assigned the task of forming temporary companies from incoming replenishments and those of the wounded who could still remain in the rank. The remnants of the Grenadier motorized battalions were merged into two combat groups. Some tank companies were moved to the Lee Niborg area for rest, repair and replenishment. The few surviving vehicles had to be rebuilt. We worked feverishly to bring units to combat readiness, made plans and replenished supplies. I was ordered to arrive at the ISS Tank Corps. Eric Holsten had left me a few days earlier to take part in a combat operation. The young soldiers wanted one of the former comrades to come to me as Eric's successor. The idea arose to transfer Max Bornheft, my assistant in 1940-1943, from the 1st SS Motorized Reconnaissance Battalion to our division. When this happened, 
the surprise expressed on the faces of my marvellous soldiers was complete. To the cheers of the liaisons, Max and Wan Shi shook hands. We sat side by side again exactly one year after we had parted. On the way to the ICC tank corps, we were pursued by enemy fighters. The straight road of death from Falaise to Cayenne was constantly patrolled by enemy fighters and used only by a few motorcycle liaisons. There was no transportation of supplies along it. Their delivery to the formations could be made only at night. ISS Panzer Corps moved its command post to a densely vegetated, wooded area south of the town of bretville sur les More than an hour late, I presented myself to the Corps' Commander General Dietrich. Suddenly, quite unexpectedly, I found myself face to face with the Commander-in-Chief of the German forces in the West, Field Marshal von Rundstedt. The Commander-in-Chief and Sepp Dietrich were sitting in the shade of a tree and were speaking unflatteringly about the constant interference of the Wehrmacht High Command. The old field marshal expressed his appreciation for the 12th SS Panzer Division. He regretted the irreparable losses of the division and reiterated his admiration for the professionalism of the young soldiers. In short, he compared the young guys at Langemark with the same young guys at Khan. The young soldiers at Cayenne have the same ardor as their peers in the regiments at Langemark, but they far surpass the latter in training especially in that in which they have been led by experienced officers and non-commissioned officers. It is terrible that these dedicated young men are sacrificing themselves in a hopeless situation. During lunch I listened in amazement as the field marshal and Sepp Dietrich openly condemned the conduct of the war in Normandy. The conversation revealed an agreement between the commander-in-chief, the commander of the ISS Panzer Corps, general and myself as to the intolerability of the present state of affairs. On July 17, my division was raised on alert. The enemy had broken through the defences of the 272nd Infantry Division between Malto and Vendee. The enemy was driven back by a counter-attack and was prevented from reaching or but 50 men were taken prisoner during the operation. In the afternoon I was surprised by an order from the headquarters of the ISS Tank Corps, ordering me to report to Field Marshal Rommel. Field Marshal expressed his appreciation of our 12th Division and regretted that due to lack of time he could not visit us. He then asked me for my assessment of the situation. In reply I said, a British offensive south of KN can be expected soon. The attack will be aimed at our right wing a critical section of the front in Normandy. Having crumpled it, the British will begin to advance into the centre of France. Our units will fight and soldiers will continue to die in their positions, but they will not prevent British tanks from driving over their bodies and marching on Paris. The overwhelming superiority of the enemy in the air makes tactical manoeuvre virtually impossible. Allied fighters attack even individual liaisons on motorcycles. Relocation of the smallest units, not to mention the formation of a strike group. Because of the incessant air raids cannot be made without serious losses. The road network is under the control of enemy aircraft day and night. A few fighters are enough to interfere with traffic or even paralyze it. Mr. Field Marshal, give us air cover, give us a few air units of fighters. We are not afraid of the enemy's ground forces, but we are helpless against the enemy's massive use of air power. I had better not make this last request. I saw that I had touched a sensitive area, the field marshal said excitedly. To whom are you telling this? Do you think I drive around the neighborhood with my eyes closed? I'm sending report after report. I've already pointed out the destructive effectiveness of fighters acting as attack aircraft in Africa. But of course they know better up there. Save my reports any more, something must happen. The war in the West has to end but what will happen in the East? The field marshal and I paced back and forth for several minutes before he bade me a warm farewell. Sepp Dietrich asked the field marshal to be careful and avoid the highway. He offered to replace his large automobile with a Volkswagen. The field marshal refused the offer with a smile and drove off. A short time later at Forex de Montgomery he was attacked from the air and was to the southeast of the River Orne are the suburbs of Cayenne, Foix de Vosselle, and Cormel. Here were modern industrial complexes 
surrounded by residential working-class neighborhoods. Immediately south of these residential areas lay the rich, fertile fields of Normandy. They extended all the way to the ancient town of Falaise, where William the Conqueror was born. The terrain between the two towns gradually ascended and reached a height of 200 meters above sea level on both sides of the Potigny. The uplands here are forested and offer views to the south. Just south of the ridge of hills and Potigny, the road to Falaise is crossed by the Lezen River. Cayen and Falaise are connected by National Highway 158, a straight road that turns slightly at Potigny. A sparse forest stretches on either side of the road. Montgomery's plan after the capture of Cayenne was to break the front and reach the heights between Falaise and Cayenne. In order to implement this plan, were allocated VI British Corps with three armoured divisions and I Canadian Corps with two infantry divisions and a tank brigade. The attack was to be supported by the US 9th Air Army and the 2nd Air Force Tactical Force. These superior forces were opposed by the 272nd Infantry Division, the badly battered 21st Armoured Division with remnants of the 16th Airfield Division and parts of the 1st SS Panzer Division. Two battle groups of the 12th SS Panzer Division were in reserve in the Potigny area. The German leadership expected in the near future a major enemy offensive south of Cayenne. The attack at Malteau was seen only as a diversionary maneuver. In order to prevent the enemy breakthrough to the east, one battle group of the 12th Panzer Division was moved to the area of Lisieux. In the evening of July 17, I visited the commander of the 5th Tank Army. Tank General Eberbach was confident that an attack should be expected in the next few hours. All units in the Khan section were put on alert. Early in the morning of July 18, the ground south of Cayenne shook. Allied air forces began to work our positions, dropping 7,700 tons of bombs. Stormtroopers attacked German artillery positions and roads just behind the front line. The first bombs were a wake-up call for the task force. The grenadiers jumped into their vehicles, brushing the remnants of sleep from their eyes. They asked no questions. Almost no conversation could be heard. The soldiers were silently preparing for the upcoming battle. We had no illusions. Officers and soldiers knew the futility of battle. They awaited the battle order silently, but with determination to fulfill their duty to the end. The battle group operated on both sides of the road Canyai. Vimont on the section where the 21st Panzer Division fought hard. The enemy tanks were stopped at Freneville, and all further attacks by them were repulsed with heavy losses to the enemy. The remaining units of the 12th Armored Division during the following night had to take over the 21st Armored Division's defensive section on both sides of the Cagney Viment Road. In the neighboring section, the 1st SS Panzer Division destroyed over 100 tanks of the British 11th Panzer Division. Jochen Piper with his Panthers again saved the day. Montgomery's large scale offensive did not achieve its goal. Upland, which was his goal, was still controlled by the Germans. The fighting that took place was in its character an exact copy of the previous battles. A well-planned operation and a huge amount of combat equipment, followed by an uncertain tank attack without a purposeful and decisive onslaught. By then, the British tank units had only occupied the rugged terrain. Where did the spirit of the Light Brigade in the Battle of Balaclava in the Crimean War enemy tanks crawled across the terrain like turtles? The power of their numerically large mass was not used. In the shortest possible time, our division improved its position. The enemy was no longer attacking in our sector. On July 20, together with the commander of the 12th SES Motorized Reconnaissance Battalion, I visited the division's positions and reconnoitred a reserve position on the line from Vimont to St. Sylvain. The new position was immediately equipped with strong points. We could no longer afford the luxury of a system of solid defense, for the combat strength of the division was now at best equal to that of a reinforced regiment. I returned to the divisional command post at about 1900 hours and was informed of an assassination attempt in the Führer's headquarters. The attempted assassination attempt on Hitler had no effect on the relationship between the army and the Waffen-S units. There was no disagreement among the combat units. 
The terrorist act was rejected by all units equally. The soldiers were not at all sympathetic to the participants in the July 20 conspiracy. They longed for an end to the war and themselves sought ways and means to end the useless slaughter. The German soldiers, however, never thought of breaking their military oaths. Early in the morning of July 21, the commander of the battle group Waldmuller reported that Field Marshal von Kluge went to the front line on the site of the task force and inspect the positions on the front line. Field Marshal von Kluge was trying to form his own impression of the state of his forces and chose the 12th CS Panzer Division for this purpose. The Field Marshal familiarized himself with the situation and agreed with my assessment of the situation. He expressed his gratitude to the young soldiers for their admirable bravery and announced that soon we will be replaced by an infantry division. Von Kluge proved to be a very open man and was completely frank with me. He considered the situation in Normandy very critical. He sharply criticized the static defense of the territory of Normandy. Field Marshal remained at the command post for several hours and spoke with the commander of the 5th Panzer Army, General Eberbach, as well as with the commander of the ISS Panzer Corps, General Sepp Tietrich, and the commander of the 21st Panzer Division Fuchting, having inspected the front. Von Kluge sent a detailed report on the true state of affairs to Hitler. During the previous week, the enemy conducted attacks on the site of our division. Radio intercepts gave us reason to expect a new attack along the road to Vermont. Major General Pels commander of all our combat aviation on the Western Front, arrived unexpectedly at the division to coordinate the Luftwaffe with the operations of the ground forces. Fighter formations were to take to the air from airfields in Holland and Belgium. There were no forward guidance posts necessary to give the right direction to the planes. Communication was established only by means of signal lights. Air formations had to reach the front flying at low altitude. We were most concerned whether it would be possible to achieve the desired result by these measures. See, a few days after the reconnaissance was followed by the first combat, sortie of 20 to 30 machines. The units could not believe their eyes that the German planes finally appeared almost two months after the beginning of the Allied invasion. German planes flew over the front at an altitude of about 50 meters. Unfortunately, the planes of the second wave dropped their bombs directly on the positions of the 1st Battalion of the 25th SS Grenadier Motorized Regiment. Major General Pels and I had the pleasure of lying down under a hail of our own bombs. Fortunately, there were no casualties. Such an operation was never repeated. On the night of August 5, our division was replaced by the 272nd Infantry Division, which had positioned itself for rest and replenishment in the area east of Falaise. However, because of recent events, the order was cancelled and the division was already in reserve north of Falaise. We waited in vain for major reinforcements and received only a company of tank fighters, which was only partially motorized. The Grenadier Motorized Regiment was not replenished with a single soldier. While visiting the SSI tank corps, I noticed with a shudder that all the tank divisions that had fought east of the Orne were now west of it. The 2nd, 116th, and 21st Panzer Divisions were all concentrated west of Orne, as were the 1st and 9th Panzer Divisions. Next, the remnants of my division, with about 50 fighting vehicles, were our only tank force east of Orne. This meant that the two battle groups of the 12th Panzer Division were the only operational reserves east of the river. This denuded the German front south of the Khan and was of great concern. In the event of a renewed Allied attack on the eastern flank of the German front will inevitably form a gap and the way to the interior of France will be open. With only 50 remaining tanks, could not hope that we could stop three armoured divisions and three infantry divisions of the British and Canadians. We foresaw the collapse of the eastern flank of the German front in the west and prepared for the last battle. On the evening of August 6, the 59th British Division successfully captured a bridgehead behind the Orne at Thuriaco Year. Krause's battle group was ordered, in cooperation with units of the 89th Infantry Division, to immediately destroy the bridge. Moving from St. Laurent, the battle group was able to clear the Fort de Grimbos from the enemy, 
but when it came out of the wooded to open terrain that gradually descended to the Orn, was pinned down by concentrated artillery fire. The enemy occupying the heights on the west bank of the Orne River had excellent positions for observation. On the morning of August 7, I went to Krause's battle group and found his command post in a forest hut at Fort de Grimbos. Wounded soldiers of the 89th Infantry Division and task force were lying in the shade of tall trees awaiting evacuation. Enemy artillery fire covered the road and the edge of the forest to the south. Despite the huge superiority of the enemy in artillery, we managed to occupy the Fort de Grimbos and reduce the enemy bridgehead. Again, the losses were appallingly heavy. I hardly saw a single unharmed soldier of ours here. The artillery fire on the forest was devastating. Before the bridgehead was completely eliminated, events occurred that put this operation in second place and led to the immediate withdrawal of Krause's battle group. The Allies were aware of the movement of panzer divisions to the western section of the front, and that south of Cayenne, in addition to the 50 fighting vehicles left over from the 12th Sears Panzer Division, which had been burned up in the fighting, we had only two infantry divisions. What could be more obvious than a manoeuvre consisting of crushing the weak German eastern flank and rush south through Falaise? By doing so, the British, in concert with American forces, would surround and destroy the German armies in Normandy. On August 4, Montgomery ordered the 1st Canadian Army to launch an attack towards Falaise to hasten the collapse of the German army. Lieutenant General Simmons, commander of the II Canadian Corps, was assigned this task. General Simons was the youngest corps commander in the Canadian Army, and no doubt a worthy opponent. He had at one time commanded an armoured division in Italy and was an excellent strategist and tactician. Perhaps he was an outstanding staff officer, but I am not at liberty to judge whether he was an equally capable combat commander. The battle south of Cayenne demonstrated conclusively that the Canadians lacked a vigorous tank commander. At the same time, the battles were fought at their huge advantage in manpower and equipment. However, not once did the commanders of Canadian units and formations dare to make spontaneous decisions or take advantage of a favourable situation arising in the course of the battle. Combat commanders lacked initiative, the ability to quickly seize an opportunity and lead their tanks deep into defensive positions and into the enemy rear. The Canadians on the offensive slowly crept south, uncertain, wary, waiting for orders from above. General Simons had the following forces available for Operation Totalize. 51st British Infantry Division, 1st Polish Armoured Division, 4th Canadian Armoured Division, 2nd Canadian Infantry Division, 33rd Canadian Armoured Brigade, 2nd Canadian Armoured Brigade, 3rd Canadian Infantry Brigade. With these forces, General Simons intended to crush the German defences and reach the town of Falaise. According to General Creerar, commander of the 1st Canadian Army, the day of August 8, 1944 was destined to be an even blacker day for the German Army than August 8, 1918 in the battles east of Amiens. General Simmons' plan was to attack in the dark without artillery preparation and break through the strongholds of the German defences using long and dense tank columns. The infantry accompanying the tanks was to follow in armoured personnel carriers and attack the presumed second line of German defences. The night attack involved the use of a large formation of British night bombers. The second phase of the attack was to begin just after noon, with the American 8th Air Force fighting to clear the way for the tank armada. The third phase was to culminate near the evening of August 8, with the encirclement of Falaise. As planned, our Canadian Corps concentrated its entire concentrated strength on August 7. Tanks went closely together and represented in the hands of Canadian commanders' deadly lance. In all likelihood, such concentrated tank power simply could not be. She had to simply crush our defences. Deployment of forces Canadians, it would seem, guaranteed them to neutralise the German eastern flank in Normandy. Carrar's words were justified. However, the god of war reasoned otherwise. Despite the huge concentration of military equipment, the victory remained for the people. The advancing tank columns were stopped by German soldiers who were not afraid to look death in the face. 
The IE Canadian Corps' objective was achieved eight days later than planned. The ruins of Falaise did not fall into Canadian hands until April 16. How did things look on the German side on August 7? Seven main Allied formations of several hundred tanks and hundreds of heavy bombers and fighter attack aircraft were opposed by the 89th Infantry Division. This division had no tanks, heavy anti-tank guns or mobile reserves. The artillery was horse-drawn and could be easily neutralized. East of Orne, there were only two battle groups of the 12th ES Panzer Division. However, Krause's battle group on 7 Aviut was involved in the attack on the bridgehead at Thuriaka and was about 20 kilometers away from the area of the Canadian advance. The 12th Armoured Division, together with the 101st SE Heavy Tank Battalion, a battalion of the ISS Tank Corps consisting of Tigers, had about 50 tanks left and nothing more. Moreover, our other infantry unit in the area, the 85th Infantry Division, was still on the march. Its forward units had only reached the Trina area. We could expect to put the division into combat at the earliest on August 10. Following my return from the Thury Arkua area, a lengthy report on the situation was sent to Corps headquarters. It strongly cautioned the withdrawal of the last tanks to the south of Khan. In my report, I also argued the need for my two battle groups to be deployed in the right direction. The incessant bombing and rumbling north of Brettville, which began shortly before midnight, spoke of the beginning of the expected Allied offensive. The positions of the 89th Infantry Division came under heavy air attacks. The sky lit up with the flashes of explosions. The front was on fire. The first bombs automatically went off as an alarm signal for our units. The division's reconnaissance units moved north, trying to contact the fighting units of the 89th Infantry Division. Hour after hour passed in languid anticipation of the coming day. The rumble of bombs dropped from enemy bombers, resembling the blows of a giant hammer, told us more than anyone else. It was out of the question to run away from this infernal fire. Hell had opened up to swallow our soldiers.